So we're starting with the, the whole concept of today's webinar is the transition clock is ticking. And so what we want you to think about is that we have a finite time, amount of time, to prepare youth to seamlessly transition from school to their adult life. And this sounds like it might be an easy thing to do, but it's really quite complicated. And when we talk about a seamless transition, what we're talking about is that the last day of high school looks very similar or almost indistinguishable from the first day after graduation. And students are prepared to live, learn, work, and play in their desired communities and that they're connected to whatever supports or services they need in order to participate in these activities. But if you think about it, the largest responsibility for transition lies with the school under ideal legislation, the laws that govern school. However, the school players are the ones that end at the point of transition as students are supposed to be picked up by adult agencies. And ideally, it's a smooth transition from school to adult supports and services. But the, one of the tricky pieces about transition is that you're going from a system of services that are entitled, meaning if you have a disability, you're entitled to get special ed services that are individualized to your needs. However, the day after high school, you're, you're, you have entered a system that's based on availability and eligibility. And so it's a little tricky to navigate smoothly from one system to the next. So part of what our webinar today is about is we've asked representatives from various agencies and a school to highlight some of the strategies that they recommend or they use to help students transfer and transition from school to adult services, or to adult life, rather. And so the thing that's really going to help you in terms of transitioning successfully is identifying where you're going in the end. Where are you transitioning to? And a strategy that works to, to help families and students and all team members really visualize where this student is going to be after high school is think about the day after school being a blank daytimer page. And your goal for transition is to fill up that page. If we don't do a good job transition planning, the day after high school is going to be that blank daytimer page. If we do a good job, that student's going to know what they're doing from 8 in the morning till 4 at night, or when they were typically attending school. And so think about where they're going to work, where they're going to live, what are they going to do for fun, and if this person still needs supports after they graduate from high school, Who's going to provide those supports? And part of the challenge in planning for the future is understanding what the expectations are of the future environment and how supports are delivered to people in that adult environment. And so, you know, if a student is graduating from special ed in high school and going on to post-secondary education at college or community college, one of the big differences is that there isn't a case manager that shadows that student through college. The expectations of the student's initiation, their disclosure of their disability, of asking for what they need in terms of supports, those expectations are drastically different in college. And if somebody's graduating and going to work, and they've had supports provided during high school, if they don't have supports from a formal employment agency, somebody's going to need to pick up those supports when they graduate. 
So a big piece in transition planning is understanding who may or may not be providing supports to this individual once they exit high school, and what are the expectations for that individual and the family to lead or initiate or manage those supports. And so I'm going to turn it over to Lan Ann, um, and she's going to be talking about the school's role in transition. And let me unmute you. Oh, and thanks, Ellen, for punting. This is Kim Brown, and I apologize to everyone for the technical difficulties. Things worked well in rehearsal, and they worked well this morning during login, but um, at the last minute, stuff crashed. So I apologize. I'll do just a couple of welcome remarks first before we turn it over to Lan Ann, if that's OK. Um, this is Kim Brown, and I'm with the Rural Institute Transition and Employment Projects. I will be your moderator today, as long as I'm able to stay connected. And, and again, I apologize for the technical difficulties. Today's webinar is sponsored by the University of Montana Rural Institute Transition and Employment Projects, and it is funded in whole or in part under a contract with the Montana Department of Public Health and Human Services. The statements shared in today's presentation do not necessarily reflect the opinion of the department. And since today's presenters are all based in Montana, the information that they share will be based on Montana programs, policies, and procedures. So if you are tuning in from another state, please note that the transition requirements and services in your state may be different than what you hear about today. All of our attendees are currently muted to cut down on background noise. So if you would like to ask one of the presenters a question, you can type it into the chat box on your screen. If you don't see the chat box, click on the orange arrow that's up toward the upper right-hand area of your screen, and that should open the chat box so that you can ask questions. We will have time after each presenter presents for you to ask them questions, and then we'll also have time at the end of today's session if you have questions for any of the presenters. For those of you who requested Montana Office of Public Inst Instruction Renewal Units when you registered, we will email those to you after the webinar, and it can take up to two weeks to get those out to you by email. Please note that you do have to have pre-registered in order to receive the OPI credit, and we are not able to issue other kinds of attendance documentation at this time. Today's session is being audio taped for the Rural Institute Transition and Employment Projects Resource Library and also for the Rural Institute Buck Online Transition Toolbox. And I'll put the URLs for both of those websites up in the chat box a little bit later during the presentation. The PowerPoint for today's session is currently posted on our website. We just got that up uh, about half an hour ago. So if you're interested in printing off the slides or in having a PDF version of today's slideshow, that is available on our website. And again, I'll put the URL in the chat box in just a bit. After the session ends today, you'll have a short survey pop up on your screen. It's about eight questions. And we do ask that you take a few minutes to fill that out. We really value your feedback, and we use it as we continue to develop webinars for the future. Um, our presenters today, again, thank you so much, Ellen, for punting and being our first out of the gate today. Um, Ellen is the UM Rural Institute Transition and Employment Projects Director. Then we have Lan Ann Bryant, who is the Vocational Preparation Teacher and Transition Specialist at Big Sky High School in, Monta in Missoula, Montana. She's also a Rural Institute Consumer Advisory Council member. We have Loretta Lowe, who's the Region 3 Developmental Disabilities Program Case Management Supervisor based in Billings and Jeannie Stone, who is a Montana Vocational Rehabilitation Counselor based in Missoula. And Jeannie is also a Rural Institute Consumer Advisory Council member. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Lan Ann. Thanks. Thanks, Kim. So my name is Lan Ann Bryant, and I am a teacher at Big Sky High School in Missoula, Montana. I am the Vocational Preparation II teacher, and it's a class that is designed to help students develop skills for the world of work. So my expertise is actually um, developing, helping students figure out what they want to do for the world of work. And so sometimes in my presentation, you might hear me talk more about that component, although not everyone, not all students are 
going to go into the world of work. So I just wanted to make that clear to you guys. Um, I also help or assist students to access outside agencies for post-secondary school for, and for work, leisure, and living in our community according to their strengths, preferences, and interests, and which is a very important um, component of the IEP process. Um, right now you see a screen, on the screen you see um, a, oh, I just lost my screen. Um, you see a poem from President Lincoln, and I think it's very appropriate that he had so, he was so in the game and understood mankind that this applies even now today. You cannot help the rich, or you cannot help the poor by destroying the rich. You cannot strengthen the weak by weakening the strong. You cannot bring about prosperity by discouraging discouraging thrift. You cannot lift the wage earner up by pulling the wage payer down. You cannot further the brotherhood of man by inciting a class hatred. You cannot build character and courage by taking away people's initiative and independence. And this next one, you cannot help people permanently by doing for them what they could and should, should do for themselves. That's kind of what we live by in my vocational program, helping students find their strengths and helping them transition into the world with knowing those strengths and knowing what they're capable of and what things they may need to have help with. Next, please. Um, <clears throat> Gary M. Clark puts transition kind of in a nutshell for you guys. Transition assessment is a process of obtaining, organizing, and using information to assist all individuals with disabilities of all ages and their families in making all critical transition in those individuals' lives both successful and satisfying. And I thought this was a great quote um, because it really encompasses everything about transition, which obviously is very, um, important, and I know that a lot of schools really um, struggle with that transition process. Um, I wanted to also let you know that transition can start at any age. I personally believe it needs to start as early as possible. Um, I know in the state of Montana, we used to start transition at 14, and years ago they decided to change that to 16. And I believe that transition needs to start before that because when a student comes into high school, they need to have some sort of a plan, realizing that that plan could change at any moment. But we want to make sure that the classes that they take and the activities they get involved in when they do go to high school encompasses everything that they want to do in the future. Next, please. So this is a quote I have on my whiteboard in the front of my classroom from day one. What plan do you have the day after you graduate from high school? Now, mine's a little bit different. Mine says, what plan do you have for the world of work the day after you graduate from high school? Because that's what my class is all about. But I think it's very important that students understand that they need to have a plan. And it's important that families understand that they are part of that plan. I can't stress how important it is to involve our students in all aspects of the transition. Um, transition in a nutshell, these are four components that I very strongly believe in. Transition looks differently for each individual student. So you, I might, as an educator, have a plan in the back of my mind for my students. Um, and parents might have a plan, but the bottom line is it's the individual student that needs to have that plan, and we need to make sure that we are listening to them and understanding what they want. And a lot of times, unfortunately, in high school, I'll have students that will say, I have no idea. Well, you know, that's okay, and I don't criticize them for that, but I tell them that, well, we need to come up with a plan, so we're going to help you come up with a plan. In order to come up with a plan, you have to use a variety of assessment and tools. Um, and you need to know your students in a very personal way. 
I'm a very blessed. I'm a special educator. I have small classrooms. I spend a good um, probably three to four weeks, depending on the students, in my classroom before I start placing them out in the community um, in, in work experiences or into our thrift store here at our school and work experiences where I have them do a variety of assessments. And we do, I do the whole gambit. I do um, computer assessments. I do um, personal assessments where they just, all they have to do is tell me what they know. What do you know? And then that way I can assess students and figure out, well, these are things that they need to know. How can I help them find out about these things? There's also a variety of outside agencies and resources that should be considered during the transition process. And we have been very fortunate in our community to have built, built a very strong um, relationship with vocational rehabilitation services. Um, they actually come into our schools. For years, I would have to make arrangements for the students to get to vocational rehabilitation services which was across town. Um, we live, our, our school is not so easy to get to. Um, there is a bus system, but it takes quite a um, long time to get where you need to go. So planning was really difficult because I, as a teacher, I can't transport students. So, then, um, so we would, you know, have to make all these arrangements and make sure parents were on the, you know, could find the place. And I mean, it, became a very difficult process. And so um, years ago, they just decided they were going to come to us. And I have blocks of time on Wednesdays, every Wednesday, from at 1 o'clock, or, or excuse me, at 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock, and 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock. I schedule students so that, and parents on their time and according to their schedule, um, for voc rehab to come in and take an application and talk to them about their services. Um, also, there's a transition checklist for grades 9 through 12. And this checklist, uh, we started using this in our district years ago. It's kind of gone by the wayside, but I still use the checklist. And I've added to the checklist over the, the last few years, or nine years to be exact you know, as I see things happen. So there's um, a lot of changes that have come across, and yours may look differently than mine. So transition looks differently for each individual, and it's based on the students, their interests and preferences, employment, independent living, recreation and leisure, community participation, post-secondary and lifelong learning, and adult services and resources. And those are all components that actually fulfill the IEP requirements on the transition pages. Um, and, it, and all of them need to be addressed. Some of them will not apply for a, to a student, and some will. You just have to look at the individual. We use a variety of assessment tools um, that allow you to get to know um, students in a personal way. Next slide, please. So we have paper pencil assessments. One of the first things I do with my students is I ask them their personal information. And you'd be surprised at how many students don't even know those things. And, you know, so then I show them a variety of ways how they can figure those things out. So starting with the simplest assessment, the most basic assessment and working to the most difficult assessment would be my recommendation. Um, I do all kinds of inventories. There's a, a, a vast load of wonderful testing out there, or assessments out there. Um, you need to find out your students' expectations. What do they want, basically? Um, I also have a Moodle online classroom, which is an extended um, version of my classroom where the kids can access it 24-7. And I have a variety of things that they can do on the Moodle. Also, and, it, and actually I have a part, portion for parents so that they can look at it and they can get more information on things. Um, I talk to teachers all the time. I have paraeducators and job coaches. And um, I love um, when I get students in with voc, re, 
vocational rehabilitation services because they do a variety of assessments on students. And I can take that information and we can work together and try to figure out where this, you know, what best helps this student. Um, interviewing with parents and teachers and, and um, the students themselves. I have one-to-one -one interviews on a regular basis. School documentation. Attendance, oh my goodness, T attendance is really, really important because attendance will give you an idea of how that student perceives education in school. And also it might show you if there's health issues. Um, there's a whole variety of things that you can acquire by even looking at a student's attendance. And I usually go back into the middle school and take a look at that the tenants in the middle schools, just because I feel like I, that gives me a very, a, a better idea and perspective on that student. Um, we have access to academic achievements and formal testing and knowing if they're in extracurricular activi activities and then I know at our school we can pull up a behavioral log and, and see those things. And then, of course, Important are the IEPs and the evaluation reports, and I try to go through them as much as I possibly can to, to glean more information for my students. Adult services, there's, there's just a vast variety of adult services that are out there, and they all are unique and work differently. Um, with vocational rehabilitation services, we try to get them in here the junior year of our, um, of the junior, by the junior IEP date. Depending, if I have students that are going to second in, off the post-secondary education, I don't usually do that referral until after they are um, um, getting ready for their senior year. Because Voc Rehab also has a timeline, and so you have to be very conscientious about all the different services and what their timeline is. I found out most recently that our housing authority here in Missoula, I mean, it has a really long list, and I've known that for years. I was just told recently that we didn't have to wait till 18, that we could start applying and helping students apply for housing. Um, as early as we possibly can. And so that was really good information for us to know. So in your community, it's going to be different. But getting a hold and talking to all the resources that we have, um, our youth home services here in Missoula are amazing. And they are really helpful. And they are really an important process of the transition. And I try to make sure that all the players are involved. And believe me, we've had some of the meetings that we have 20 people in a meeting talking about a transition for a student it could be very intimidating, but it's also it's helpful for the students to understand and see that all of these people are there for them, to, to help them. Um, we have post-secondary and lifelong learning things that we do, um, ACT testing, state of Montana now does the ACT testing for all juniors. This just started this year. It's free. Um, there's a whole process with trying to determine, you know, if it's beneficial for some students or if it is not. And, that, and that's an individual thing. Um, we have college assessments. We have college applications. All of those things that the students do in helping them filling out college applications or helping them even fill out um, job applications can give you an idea of where they are and what their thinking process is. Also, I, can't, I cannot express as, um, more how, how important the family is um, and how important, you know, I really strongly believe that, um, that the importance of the family getting the students started on what they want to do or finding out what they want to do, giving them a variety of opportunities as best you can through the school or on their own. Um, starting chores at home is really important. I'm flabbergasted sometimes about how many students don't do anything at home. Well, you know, that really starts them understanding what it is to take, to take care of themselves and take care of other people and being a part. Um, we have you know, assessments through the community. Kids are involved in the Special Olympics and, and in clubs and hobbies and in participating in volunteer things. We have a lot of students that come into high school and they've already started participating in volunteer 
things. And a lot of that comes from agencies um, getting on board and, and really helping them understand how important that is. Next, please. There are a variety of agencies. I already kind of talked about most of these agencies. Um, and there's also links to these agencies. You can Google them, um, like Vocational Rehabilitation Services. Those are national. Development of Disabilities is national. Summit Independent Living Center. So most of these agencies are national agencies. And you can get on the line and Google them and find out all about what they have to offer. Next, please. Okay, so this is the, my transition checklist for grade nine. Now, um, <laughs> what you're going to see as we go through these things is that it's they're they're just I guess keep in mind that it's different for every student. Um, I am a component. I mean, I really strongly believe that you know as many things as we can do starting as early as we can will help everyone transition through. It is a transition for me as an educator as well. I mean, I get into the panic mode. You know, I'm looking six months before graduation and I'm like checking off my list trying to figure out if I, you know, if I've done what I need to do and, if, and, and I can't tell you how disappointing it is when I go into a final meeting, IEP meeting or a meeting with a family and the parents are unprepared. Um, and I have not done my job in preparing them. It's very heartbreaking. So we have this checklist. It's, it's you know, we talk about, you know, um, developing interest worksheets, using career inventory, interest inventories. There's some great Montana Career Information Systems is a great source. Um, they have all kinds of stuff from middle school on up through college, assessments and things that kids could do. In Montana, you can go, your school librarian should know the access to, and how you can get on the Montana Career Information System. I know that the Career Information System is throughout the nation. I have gone to other states onto their Career Information System just to see what they've got going on, and if there's something that I can use on there. Now, as a school, you have more access, a deeper access to some of the assessments. And so you need to go through the library to make sure that you get the right codes and everything in order to, to get on. Every student can develop a portfolio. And that's what I love about it. And that portfolio can hold on to the assessments. And then they can do a new assessment of that you know, from year to year, and you can compare the assessments, and you can put on a resume, I mean, and, and add to the resume, you can, um, and they can access that forever. Um, once they put that portfolio, until that system goes down, it's there, and they can access it. Um, I do a lot of learning styles. I think it's really important that kids understand what is your learning style. We all have learning styles. And um, I've got there, and you can Google learning styles, and there's a whole bunch of different assessments. Um, one important, really important thing is if a student is 15 and you're doing an IEP, you need to be very, very careful that. Um, that student doesn't turn 16 before the next IEP. So because by state regulations, we need to make sure that they are doing a transition IEP. I personally do a transition IEP from the first time I meet a student. And I, you know, unfortunately only mostly have juniors and seniors, but every now and then I'll get a freshman or a sophomore and do an IEP for them, and I always do the transition IEP. That's just my personal preference. Um, putting them in work experiences. Here at our school, we have a variety of on-campus work experiences, from working in the library to helping the school nurse, to um, delivering messages, to recycling, um, to working in our thrift store. Um, that is actually run by my Vogue Prep 2 students. Um, so 
and working in the kitchen, the school kitchen. There's a variety of things that you can do in, within your school to help sco students learn and understand um, the IEP process, or learn about transition and, and to get a work experience. So it's important that you do a four-year course plan. And I always am really um, cautious to let parents know and students know that this is a living document. This is going to change. As you go through life, as you go through your high school career, you, what you want to learn about is going to change. But it's important that you establish that four-year course plan so that you can see, so the student can see, and that the teachers can see, and the parents can see where, we are, where that student is going and how that applies to their life. Um, I know that we offer in 10th grade the PSAT for our students. It's a little bit of a cost, but it's a pretest to the SAT, and we talk about that in their ninth grade uh, meeting. So that they, so if they want to sign up, we have a list that we hand out. We give to our actually um, school psychologist, and she um, makes sure that their accommodations are available to them if they want to take that PSAT. Um, you give information on SSI and PASS and guardianship. As much information, you just ask parents. Um, we have, well, we're very fortunate. The Rural Institute has supplied us with um, a variety of brochures and information about this thing, these things. And we have those sitting in our meeting room. And if a student or if a uh, parent asks about those things, I can just reach over and pick those, uh, you know, a copy up and hand it to them and ask them to read it, and then I do a follow-up call afterwards to make sure that, that if they, under, you know, if they have any questions. Um, you need to make sure that agencies are, you know, who's going to be invited, if anyone. Um, any outside agency has to be, you, your, your parent and guardian have to sign permission before the IEP. You can't go to an IEP and have invited an outside agency, even with verbal permission, and have them come to that IEP. You have to do it prior to the IEP. And so we try to do that, you know, talk about that the year before, you know, well, next year, or in the next few months, do we need to in talk to this agency and let's get permission to do that. Um, I try to take brochures from outside agencies um, to our meetings so that if people have questions. And of course, the release of information signed if, if at all possible. Um, also, another important thing, especially in the state of Montana, initial referral for, um, um, for services for developmental disabilities program is at 16. So that 16 years is kind of interesting because it could be an incoming freshman. It could be you know, a junior, you have to really pay attention to that, that timeline um, as when you want to do those referrals. And my feeling is with DDP services that it's important that you do it as soon as you can. Please don't wait. They have a long, it's a long process. There's a lot of information they have to gather, and it's really important that that gets done. So your transition for grade 10 is just a, it just builds. It's, it just builds on top of grade nine. And um, hopefully you've already talked about some of these things, um, but it's just, you just kind of adjust things as you go along. Um, one important thing is you um, mentioned about the ACT testing that takes place the spring of the junior year. That is required for all Montana um, juniors. And, you know, we had a, a, a group of kids that the parents opt out. So you need to explain to them, you know, this is what's going on, this is what this is, and if you want to opt out, there is a way to do that. Um, again, referral to DBP services um, and making sure you figure out what agencies you need to invite and everything along that line. 
Um, for grade 9 it's, or 11, it's the same thing. It's just now you're starting to look at kids that are going to post-secondary education. And now you're starting to try to bring that component in. And so it becomes a little bit more complicated trying to decide. You know, some kids will say to you when they're freshmen, yeah, I'm going to go to college. And some will wait until they're seniors and say, well, you know, I'm really thinking about that college thing. But if you introduce it and talk to them, um, there is a great um, website called Smart About College or Smart About College.com, and it's a great guide to um, college information. Um, they've got some tests, pre-test things that kids can do. It's a it's an amazing site that's that is with that also. Um, also, you need to make sure that you're, you know, doing the same things. You're getting permission. You're, you're talking to them all about the same things you did the previous two years. Now, if a student is 18 years old and if he is a male, it is very important that he registers for selective services. If he does not, it doesn't mean that he um, can't register in the future, but it also um, opens up opportunities. Um, by registering for selective service, you can um, make sure that you have um, college, that your college stuff, you know, because they, you can't even apply for federal grants or anything without selective services. So that's a really, really important thing. And then on 12th grade, it's just the same thing. You're getting ready for that big transition. So, um, I think you get a little bit more into discussing about living options and things like that. But really, truly, your junior year, in my opinion, is, is the most critical time to really be talking about the future of living and, and leisure activities and, and what you want to do um, as far as college and things. Um, one last thing, I believe that putting together a transition record um, assembled by the students is really important. We have gotten into some um, problems where our birth certificates have been, parents don't have birth certificates, and so that puts a hold on a lot of opportunities for students. So you want to make sure that they have that component, um, that they have a disclosure statement, um, and that's, <laughs> That's another thing in itself, but um, that would be the end of everything that I can think of. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Lan Ann. Does anybody have any questions that you would like to ask either Lan Ann or Ellen at this time? And, and while I give folks a minute to type their questions into the chat box, we did have one question come in about the checklist that Lan Ann shared with all of you, wondering if there was a way to get a copy of those checklists. We do have all of the slides from today's presentation posted as a PDF document on our website. And that's the first website URL that you should see in the chat box on your screen. It's the http ruralinstitute.umt.edu slash transition, et cetera. It's that site. So if you go in and download that PDF document, you can flip through to the checklist slides that Lan Ann shared and save those or print those off or whatever you want to do with them. Any other questions for Lan Ann or for Ellen before we move on to our next speaker? Okay, I'm not seeing any, and we'll have another chance at the end of everybody's presentation. So thanks again, Lan Ann. Oh, one just came in before we move on to Loretta. How many school buildings do you work in, Lan Ann? I just work in our high school here. Just one. Just one. We have actually a transition person at each of our high school, each of our public high schools here. So there's three of us in the in the district. Okay. Thank you. And then there was a question about what is DDP, and that's the oh. Developmental Disabilities Program. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Thanks again, Lan Ann. And with that, we'll go ahead and turn it over to our next speaker, Loretta Lowe, from the Montana Department of Public Health and 
human services. Hi, this is Loretta Lowe, and I am a case management supervisor here in Billings, Montana. And um, I supervise 10 case managers, and along with my duties, I also work with individuals being referred for eligibility into the Developmental Disabilities Program. So that's what DDP does stand for, is Developmental Disabilities Program. Our mission statement, the Developmental Disabilities Program, supports choices and opportunities for people with developmental disabilities in the community. So that's the next slide. One thing that the Developmental Disability Program is tries to do is it tries to be able to give informed choices. Informed choices are things that we feel as if gives lends people a better chance to make those decisions that they are most interested in. And also it's very important that we give informed choice so that people feel like they are a part of the, the planning for their, their um, care plan. Next slide. One thing that is, has just come up in the legislature this last year is that the developmental disabilities um, definition has changed, and it is going through um, federal and state changes. That is, instead of being called mental retardation, we are now, we, um, we have replaced that with intellectual disabilities. And so the developmental disability means disabilities attribute to intellectual disabilities, cerebral palsy, epilepsy, autism, and any other neurological handicap condition closely related to the intellectual disability and requiring treatment similar to that required by intellectual disabilities individual if the disability originated before the person attained age 18, has continued or can be expected to continue indefinitely and result in the person's having a substantial disability. So individuals that are eligible for our program have to meet three criteria. They have intellectual um, IQ that has to be done, that's usually psychological, um, adaptive behavior, which is called a violent, and most important, it has to be age onset before age 18. If an individual gets into a car accident at age 18, and they are deemed disabled, they would not be eligible for our services because it was not before the age of 18 years old. So if you were to have an individual who was 17 and they got into an accident and it caused a developmental disability, then they would be eligible. We also have individuals who come to us who are older. And at that time, it's really important that we have to figure out, um, you know, we have to look back into the school records many times to be able to establish the age of onset was before age 18. And so that is kind of in, you know, talking with preparation for transitioning into adulthood, we always want to partnership with other programs in order to be able to um, get the best possible outcomes for the individuals that we serve. And we, we definitely work a lot with the schools. We work with Boca Rehab. And I know in, um, earlier when Leanne was talking, she said that it's very important that the transition starts early. And she had mentioned the age of 16, and she's correct. At age 16, you can apply for eligibility um, services. Next slide. So the eligibility process 
if you're not already referred at age 16 by either a school, a parent, a physician, you can always, as a parent, call the DDP office, the regional office, and ask for eligibility process to begin. Case manager, then, in other areas, I actually do it in the billings area, gather the documents necessary to determine eligibility. Those documents need to, need to include the psychological evaluation that's required. Other documents that also assist with determining eligibility are school evaluations, such as IEPs, doctor's reports, such as psychiatric evaluations, and then if there's ever been a social history written. Upon gathering this, then as the case management supervisor, I then assign a quality improvement specialist to complete a comprehensive assessment called a Bylin 2. This quality, first quality improvement specialist then makes an appointment with the individuals that have been referred and actually sits down with them. And the Violin A is actually a functional adaptive behavioral assessment. It's kind of knowing what their functioning level is. One thing that's really important to remember is that you might have someone with an IQ of a 75, but their mental health could be causing that IQ to drop below, and their functioning in society could be, um, their IQ could drop significantly. So I usually always have the quality improvement specialist do the functional um, violin assessment, the adaptive assessment, so that we can have a good understanding whether or not that individual is eligible for services or if there's any other things that are going on with that individual's life that could be hindering him or her. Um, and then after the, the queue has gathered the additional um, documents, then they send it off into Helena. And actually, we have a referral coordinator up there, eligibility coordinator, who actually determines the criteria based on the psychological and the violin and whether or not the person has Medicaid, Social Security, et cetera, has been deemed to have a, a developmental intellectual disability. And then the potential eligibility for services can be determined through DDP. Once that is done, then we, we, we have a determination. Like I said, it's really important at age 16 that people um, definitely find out if they're eligible. However, it's important to note that eligibility can be determined for adult services as early as eight years old, as long as they have, have a, um, they're expected to continue indefinitely and result in the person having a substantial disability. So there could be eligibilities done as early as eight that would still qualify them for eligibility at age 16. And they can actually have eligibility determined by the, by the Montana um, DDP office at age eight. And Upon further review at age 16, that can, that can just prompt the need for adult case management. Next slide. Next. Case management, you know, and I also heard in the previous um, previous speaker in, in Leanne had said that entitlement is something that happens when you're in, in school. You have the special ed, you're entitled to services. 
Well, once you have been eligible for DDP services and determined eligible, the ent only entitlement that the Developmental Disability Program has is case management. If eligibility for um, DDP services, a case manager will then be assigned. That case manager will then meet with the individual's family, legal guardian, and complete a referral packet for services to the DDP, and the persons will be entered into the DDP waiting list. Now, I have also, it is also correct that these lists, you know, are long, and there's not a lot of current funding that assists with transitioning from high school into adulthood. However, we do have some people who are receiving children's services that their current cost plan can actually move over to um, an adult cost plan at age 18, 19, when they're ready for adult services. So if individuals are ever referred to children's developmental services and are on the waiver for children's developmental services, I wanted to make a notation that that also can be very beneficial for the transitioning piece from high school into DD services. Always encourage schools, teachers, to invite um, DDP case managers to IEP meetings if there is one assigned. Um, you can always reference regional managers or regional offices to find out if an individual is deemed DD, DD eligible. Therefore, you would know if there was a case manager assigned, if there's ever a thought that you're not sure. Um, an individual, then, then what happens is the Montana Individual Resource Allocation Protocol is also developed at age 16, where we actually have a tool that we use that ensures a fair, adequate allocation for waiver services and identifies the resources required to support an individual with developmental disabilities and compares these services used by people who are similar in age, living situation, behavior, health needs, community inclusion, and quality and abilities. So that is actually a part of our referral piece that we do. Waiver is something that, like I said, we want to go put them on the wait list for DDP waiver services. Allows the state to provide services that are different from what is provided through state plan Medicaid. As an entitled case manager, we will assist individuals at the age of 16 going on to 18 with state plan Medicaid. If they are not eligible for Medicaid at age 16, they become their own guardian at age 18, and they can qualify for state plan Medicaid on their own. Therefore, that is the time where we then assist with, can this individual live on their own, supported living, get them involved with housing authority. Also, we might look into PCAs. Does this individual need some personal attendance in the home? Waiver programs are created to keep individuals with disabilities in their home and communities and out of institutions, hospitals, and nursing facilities. So our goal is least restrictive. We have the 0208 waiver, comprehensive waiver, the children's autism waiver, and we currently have a waiver in development that has not yet been um, processed through a self-direct support waiver. And those are the three waivers that we are able to refer individuals to. Next. Um, some of the services that when we, when we meet with people and determine what they want that we can refer individuals to are day habilitation, homemaker, living caregiver. Residential is usually, that's like a group home respite, 
That's like some assistance in home, supported employment, um, waiver funded children's case management services is also in the O2OB and can be accessed at a young age. Occupational therapy, physical therapy, psychological counseling services, these are all services that we can access through the waiver funding if an individual is able to get funds. Next. Speech therapy, personal support, support brokering, adult companion, adult foster support, assisted living. These are additional things that can be services that we um, put an individual on the wait list for and access through, through funding through the O208 waiver. Again, um, board certified behavior analysis, caregiver training, community transition, dietitian, environmental mod, adaptive equipment. Again, these are all things that can be purchased. Individual goods and service, meals, personal care, personal emergency response, which actually is a phone usually, or it could be a health alert call, private duty nursing, transportation, respiratory therapy, educational service, health and health maintenance, social leisure, and recreational support. Those are in addition to the others. Um, it's important to know that individuals that come into our service don't always know what they want. And in talking with um, families, it's really important that the planning starts way before they are referred to our service so that we have an idea of what are they wanting to do with their life. You know, are they wanting to live on their own? Do they want, are, is there a need for a group home? Do they need total care? All of that helps out if you have early, helps out a lot better if you have early planning. One thing that we try to do is we try to partnership with schools once they've been determined eligible at age 16 to help assist with IEPs in the transition process and to also help with referring them to like Voc Rehab. And so one thing that in this last year that has been an initiative is the Montana Employment First Initiative. The Montana Development Disability Program believes that employment, inclusion, and community is important in the lives of individuals and services. All working age individuals and services should have the opportunity to participate in meaningful work in integrated community employment, earn at least minimum or competitive wages, enjoy the benefits of community employment. The choice in the employment setting considered must use personal center planning concepts and should be based on informed choice. Although other employment options are valued as a pathway toward integration, integrated employment. Paid work in the community should be the primary service considered during the planning process. So one thing we're wanting to do is really be able to know what are those, we're always doing assessments, so when individuals are coming from high school into adult services, we want to really know what are those services that we need to be made aware of. That are those job opportunities made aware of that we can help with then referring them to voc rehab and then of course also putting them on the wait list for waiver services. Um, integrated employment or individual has a full or part time work. The job is based upon identifying needs and interests. The workplace in the community and generally has regular contact with people without disability, of the individual self-employed in their own business, the job must pay at least minimum wage. That is if you have individuals as full or part-time pay. Individuals who have competitive employment, they usually do not need support. Individuals with supportive employment, they need a job coach. And this is where if you have if you find out through the voc rehab process that this individual needs long-term funding, either for 
individual or group supportive employment, they would either need a job coach or they would need a small work environment in a community setting under the supervision of a provider agency. So those are, those are areas that we help with referring individuals to by identifying and assessing what they want to do when they're younger, what they're going to be able to do, and then refer them to those programs. Um, this is just Supportive Employment Leadership Network. We just currently, in the state of Montana, um, have an SCLN work group, Supportive Employment. And members include the Montana Council, Development of Disabilities Program, DDBP Providers, Office of Public Instruction, Vocational Rehab, Addictive Mental Disorders, Job Service, Disability Rights Montana, UM Rural Institute, and Parents. And if you need to contact any of, like I said, the DDP regional offices, if you have any questions on eligibility or wanting to know how to get an individual eligible for services, you can contact the regional offices and their, their phone numbers are listed there. They're in Glasgow, Great Falls, Billings, Helena, and Missoula. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Loretta. We do have a couple of questions that have come in for you. And if anybody else has a question or two for Loretta, we can take those as well. Um, two of the questions are similar, and they relate to when you were talking about the eligibility process. How recent is recent, both with respect to doctor visits or doctor assessments and also the psych evaluation? OK, very good question. Um, psych evaluations, if at all possible, we like within the last three years. However, that's for determining eligibility. Um, if an individual has had a psychological evaluation after the age of eight years old, we can take those as long as there's additional documentation that states that the psychological evaluation has not changed, nor would it with an additional evaluation being done. And so um, we, we probably have a standardized, it's nice to say, within the last three years. But if it's older and there's additional documentation, we consider that too. OK, thank you. If another psych evaluation is needed, who is responsible for paying for that evaluation? Well, um, we have, as far as psychological evaluation goes, we try to make sure individuals, maybe they have Medicaid and Medicaid would pay for those. The only time that really now that we're really requesting additional psychological evaluation is if we question someone's IQ has changed. So it's not necessarily about how recent the evaluation is done. It's more about we want to make sure we have an accurate evaluation. OK. Thank you. Next question, are you saying that funds cannot be used for sheltered employment? Yes, funds can be used for shelter employment. That is, that's group employment is what I was referencing. I didn't say shelter, but that was in the same category. Waiver services can go for group employment, sheltered employment, or supportive employment. OK, great. Thank you very much, Loretta. And we will have additional time at the end of, of all of the presenters if you want to ask anybody a question. With that, we'll go ahead and move on to our next presenter, Jeannie Stone from Montana Vocational Rehabilitation. Good afternoon. Um, I am a voc rehab counselor based in Missoula, um, but I do travel to Sanders County, which is a very rural county here in uh, western Montana, so I provide services there as well. The folk rehab, the goal of the Montana Vocation Rehabilitation Transition Program is to improve transition services 
It increased the number of youth with disabilities who achieved the desired post-school outcomes. Post-school outcomes can mean um, college or could be moving on to the world of work. When to contact the ER. What we ask is that um, teachers, students, or parents, concerned others, contact VR to start services spring prior to the exit year of high school. This doesn't necessarily mean the junior year, as some people are, um, some students move on to what we call super seniors, where they may stay in high school for an additional two or three years after what would be a traditional graduation. For this, it allows for additional testing guidance for the senior school, allows us to help to look for um, resources as well as to line up services after graduation so there's not such a rush at the end of the senior year or the exit year. Work experience is very important for all students that are accessing both we have to have some sort of work experience. Paid or unpaid, it all counts. It helps to show the type of work history. It can help the students identify what areas they're interested in or what areas they really don't want to work in. It helps to give them um, to see what soft skills they have, such as dressing appropriately, showing up on time, um, skills they need to work on as far as being with coworkers, and also too about if they know what kind of shift they can work. Are they best working a couple hours or can they go that eight hours? Supports after high school. Supports come in various forms, parents, DSS is Disability Services for Students, which is at most universities and colleges. Uh, families or siblings, aunts, uncles, grandparents, they can be very supportive. Friends and even technology. Technology can be take on a wide variety of forms. It could be hearing aids, communication boards, could even be um, wheelchairs, iPads, or um, assistive technology and other means as well. In Montana, we're very lucky here in Western Montana to have a service called Montech, and they help to provide evaluations on different types of assistive technology that may be um, of assistance for a student, whether it be in a work world, uh, academic setting, or even on a recreational setting. They firmly believe that in order for a person to want to work, they're going to have to have a reason for why they want to work, which is probably recreation. Some other forms of support would be case management, daily services, or even mental health. Book rehab can provide um, evaluation to help a student decide on uh, possible work goals. These are so the evaluation is done to look at limitations, strengths, interests, accommodations, abilities, and aptitudes. The previous speakers um, touched on MTCIS and ONET is another internet-based system that could be looked at as far as identifying interests and aptitudes and abilities. Some other types of things that Book Rehab can do is a vocational evaluation, which is a three-day comprehensive test that evaluates all the things that are listed on your screen. They can also do a community-based work assessment or experience for the student. They can fund a TAVI test, and most of the time that is not necessarily needed, but it is, if it is a person that is done homeschooling, that might be very helpful to see where they're at academically as far as moving on to additional training. We do have some paper and pencil assessments that we can do, such as the CAPS, COPS, COPS, or one thing that we use here in our Missoula office quite a bit is a group career decision-making system, which is kind of based on interest and um, aptitudes.
work goal, the student needs to identify, is the work goal attainable? Is it something that's really within their interests and abilities? And what is needed to obtain that goal? Is additional training something that can be done as an apprenticeship through the local adult ed, two-year, four-year? Um, and with that, the student may need the supports of their support people as well as the supports of the rehab to see what is, a, what is actually needed for that work goal and is it obtainable. The other things would be job search assistance. Does a person have the ability to look on the, the newspaper or the job service website? Does they need help with developing a resume or a cover letter and help with interview skills? Um, does a person need on-the-job supports? This can take a, a, a wide variety of looks. It could be a job coach. The job coach could be short-term or long-term. It could also be um, building natural supports. Is there a coworker there at the job site that would be willing and able to help the person um, learn the job and be successful in the long run? With folk rehab, there's some various type of work supports that we can provide. The job search assistance, as I touched on briefly before, developing the resume, um, interview skills development. That could be interviewing with the job coach. It could be interviewing with outside sources. Sometimes we can set up practice interviews that are with a group of people if a person is uncomfortable in being with a group of people to give them some more experience so they can gain some more confidence. On the job supports, again, the job coaching could be short term, could be a few hours, could be a lot of hours, depending on the level of supports that are needed for the individual. Generally, with folk rehab, once a person is hired, we will do um, 90 days of support because it's believed that within the first 90 days of a person is going to lose a job, it will happen within that time frame. If they make it beyond the 90 days, or it's likely they'll be there for the long term. Extended employment, which was touched on by Loretta, can take on a variety of works as well. Supported employment generally is within the community, and um, they will have ongoing supports on a periodic basis for the longevity of the job or as long as a person thinks that they really need the support. And that can be as little as a, you know, as a job coach checking in and making sure the employee is doing okay. It could be that some job coaching will be needed periodically for them to maintain their employment. Crew employment, um, as touched on before, is a smaller setting. Generally, there's one job coach that goes with the crew at all times. You know, they, in Missoula, it can take on a variety of things. It could be a janitorial crew. It could be doing yard work. It could be doing uh, construction site cleanup. They have a wide variety of things, and they try to appeal to a wide variety of interests that may come in with the students. One thing that is very important for the student is for them to be their own advocate. What is a disability? Do they know what it entails? Um, what supports and accommodations does the student need? It's very important for them to be able to voice what the supports and accommodations that they need, because they may not always have a support person around to help them or to be able to answer for them. How do you want to be treated? This can come into play, especially with people with a hearing disability or visual disability. What is the etiquette that, that you would like to see in place? Um, it can be you may tell the person what you need. You may have to show them. Um, it's just what is your comfort level and what do you need? And what do you have to offer? What are your strengths? 
What do you have, what unique skills would the student have to offer a potential employer? One good resource that we have here in Montana is My Life, at Montana Youth Leadership Forum. They have a camp every summer, usually in July, where students are nominated to go. These are students with disabilities from high school. And at that camp, we talk about these very things. What is your disability? What supports do you need? And try to instill in these young students how to be their own advocate, because you may not always have those supports there available for them. I know this is very brief, um, but a lot of the topics that Book Rehab works with were touched on by uh, Lan Ann and Loretta. With all of the entities, it's very important for them to work together for the interest of the student. Any questions? Thank you, Jeannie. That was great. And we do have um, one question that's come in so far. And if folks have other questions, go ahead and type those into your chat box. Um, please share your eligibility process for students who have not exited school. What we look at is their academic records. And hopefully they will have a psych eval um, that we may look at. If they don't, sometimes we will pay for that psych evaluation to see if there's any identified learning disabilities. With our students, they do not have to be within special education in order to qualify for our services. They could be any student with a disability. Um, the other thing that we would look at is a child study team as well as I um, PE paperwork to see what has been identified as a disability and what accommodations that student has had um, during high school. Okay. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, no other questions have come in yet, so we'll go ahead and turn it over to Ellen. Uh, she has a few more slides to share, and then we'll open it up for questions that you might have for any of the presenters. Okay, what you've heard about are, are both some formal support options as well as some informal support options that Jeannie talked about. But, you know, as we're thinking in terms of what services and supports young adults will need to live, learn, work, or play in their communities after they exit high school, we may find some of the supports that they have and they have ongoing may be met by formal support, such as developmental disabilities, vocational rehabilitation, mental health services, or unfortunately there may be a wait list for what people need. So one of the biggest recommendations that that we have to youth and, student and um, school folks and agencies and families is to really help define what those ongoing support needs are so that you can be really clear and creative about what your plan B could be in case you're on a wait list for some of the services and supports that you need to go to work to participate in the community and also to, um, to live independently if that's part of what you want to do. So excuse me, um, we're not going to talk about Social Security work incentives today, but on our website there are several different webinars that talked about using Social Security work incentives as a way to bridge supports from school to work for students who are eligible for SSI or supplemental security income. So we suggest having students access benefits planners and have social security benefits analyses as part of transition planning to look at 
you know, making sure families have information about the impact of wages on SSI and Medicaid, and also people know whether or not students are eligible for work incentives so that you can tap into that funding to support work if you, the student is potentially eligible. You know, Jeannie also mentioned informal supports. You know, if we can be real creative about how to meet somebody's support needs, and if we really understand the context of those needs, maybe we don't have to wait for a formal support to be available. Maybe, you know, a student just needs to learn how to contact their friends to set up social engagements during the day. Maybe that's a skill that can be taught before the student leaves high school, or maybe that's something that families can figure out some support to help the student to do while the parents and brothers and sisters go to school and work. You know, maybe it's a checklist. Maybe it's a way to help program the phone. But thinking in terms of what are different ways to get this young adult's needs met if we are on the waiting list for more formal supports. Um, if we know a lot about what students need for their ideal conditions in employment, we may not need as much in terms of formal supports for them to learn the job and maintain the job. In an environment where the natural supports are available for everybody who works there, that may be enough to keep somebody employed if the other alternative is waiting for ongoing supported employment services. Um, but I think having a really clear idea of what our ongoing support needs are is really essential as students are exiting and may or may not have all the supports available that they need to go to work, to live independently, to participate in their communities. And so in order for students and young adults to have a rich full day, we really need to have a vision of what we expect. Where are we headed? How can we come up with a plan to get from where a student is now to where they want to be the day after high school if we don't have a clear vision of what that looks like? And as Lynn Ann said, you know, some students may not have a clear vision. Part of transition planning is letting students try some different things to figure out what they do want. And part of our assessments helps students figure out what they're good at, what their support needs are, how they can participate. The other piece is, you know, in order for students to be real active as young adults, you know, something that Lan Ann brought in in her first poem. Let's support the person to self-manage and initiate as much as possible. If somebody's relying on school staff to always tell them what's next, and that they're done, or that their work is correct, we're setting up for them, we're setting them up to need formal supports forever and ever. So instead, if we teach people to self-manage, to take initiative, to move from one task to another. People are going to be far more independent and competent at work, and thereby in less need of formal supports. And I don't want to say that people don't need formal supports. Many people do. But right now, all states around the country have some pretty significant waiting lists for more formal supports. So as we're maximizing skill development and preparation of students while they're in high school, let's set them up to be as competent and independent as possible. And again, doing you know, some of the, the activities that Lan Ann talked about, making sure we're handing out information to families, to youth about adult services that are available helping people connect up with services, and then blending these supports in a plan to really um, you know, send students off 
with a rich full day with the necessary supports in place. It's tricky, but it can be done. So I'm going to leave you with two resources, um, and Lan Ann mentioned several other resources as well as um, you know the VR website that Jeannie posted and the developmental disabilities website that Loretta posted. Um, this is a planning for your transition from school to work. It's a guide that Kim and I worked on years ago. It's available in PDF on our transition website which is listed in your handouts. Um, this connects you to local agencies here in Montana, but we've had several states use the planning book with permission, have reprinted it and added their state's websites to it. The second link is the Transition Toolbox, which was a product worked on by Pluck, our, our parent training initiative, and the Rural Institute, and it's called the Transition Toolbox. And within the toolbox, there's different areas such as independent living, um, work, you know, talking about connecting with DD, with folk rehab, various apprentice programs, and again, that's specific to Montana, but you can use the example in your state. And what Lan Ann talked about is having an actual toolbox, a physical toolbox, with some of the resources in the room, the meeting room that she holds transition planning meetings in. So we hope today was helpful, and I'm going to turn it back over to Kim. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Helen. We do have a few minutes for questions. If you have things that you want to ask any of the presenters, go ahead and type those into your chat box and we'll, we'll give you an opportunity to ask your question. And while you're typing, I have just a few housekeeping remarks to make. A reminder that the evaluation should pop up as soon as you log out of today's webinar. We really do hope that you'll take a few minutes and fill that out for us. The next webinar that we'll be presenting is called In It for the Long Haul, Long-Term Supports and Employment. And that will be held on Tuesday, July 16th, from 1 until 2.30 Mountain Time. The flyer for that will be sent to Montana Transition Listserv members in the next couple of weeks, so be watching for that. The flyer and registration information will also be posted on our website in a couple of weeks. The recording from today's session will be posted to our website and also to the online transition toolbox that Ellen just mentioned. The URLs or website addresses for both of those sites should be up in your chat box. That's also where the PDF version of today's PowerPoint is posted. And Jeannie sent me several website links that might be helpful to folks, and so I'll turn those into a handout and have those posted on the website as well. Um, that may take a week or so before those and the recording get up. So any questions from anybody? Um, we have some very nice thank yous coming in. Thanks, thanks for the thank yous. Um, Kim, I just added a comment in the question box. I haven't seen it come up, though. I don't see it. Okay, well, what my comment was is that, you know, as, as we heard all the presenters today, you know, schools are talking about their requirement under IDEA that they have to complete age-appropriate transition assessments that guide students' post-school outcomes. And then Jeannie talked about the need for assessments that Folk Rehab does to determine, you know, direction for employment and sometimes independent living. And then also developmental disabilities is also doing assessments sometimes, or what some states are talking about is trying to do assessments more collaboratively, thinking in terms of transition for our youth, which one is more cost effective and also more collaborative. And so I don't have great examples yet, 
that as they become available, we can share that through our transition tidbits that, that Kim puts out um, every so often to the transition listserv. But that's something to think about as you're thinking in terms of not having adequate resources in transition and how to work smarter, not harder, for better outcomes. Excellent idea. Thanks, Ellen. Any of our presenters have any final remarks that you would like to make? This is Lenny Ann, and I was just going to say that when Ellen's talking about collaboration, one of the real simple um, collaboration tools that I use with vocational rehabilitation services is having my students fill out the application themselves. I think it gives them um, insight as to what's going to be happening during the interview process, and it also helps me and also Voc Rehab to understand where they are in their understanding of certain aspects. And our application is like one, it's one page two-sided. So it's very simple, very easy to fill out. And then if the students, of course, then when parents come or if the students are 18 and they have things they need to figure out, I, that's kind of a homework assignment. Well, you need to find out, you know, who your doctor is or, or whatever is the component that's left out of it. Um, so just, you know, you can take really simple things and make and use them as an assessment. Thank you. Any final comments from Jeannie or Loretta? What's that again? Any final comments from you, Loretta? No, I'm, I'm good. Okay. How about you, Jeannie? I'm, I'm good as well. Lane Ann did a really great job of, of um, explaining how Voc Rehab and uh, the school works together. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you to all of our presenters today. We really appreciate your time and your willingness to share information with the audience. And thank you to all of our audience members. We appreciate your patience with the technical difficulties earlier today. and. We appreciate you hanging in there, asking questions, and listening to the information that our presenters had to share. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Kim. Hey, and remember that this presentation will be archived on our website. And our presenters spent a lot of time preparing information. And so if you can think of another way to use this fantastic webinar, Please send parents to it, send other new teachers to it, um, new staff, anybody who wants information that was shared today. It will be up ongoing on our website. Great. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.